close. He smells something. He stops and sniffs around, and then he looks up at me and just turns and crawls away. It's a cool video. People, are, people think I'm crazy, but oh well. <laughs> I was waiting. I could be trying to or, you know. Okay. Um, so I So hi everyone, uh, my name's Dana, and uh, I'm actually a master's student right now working under Carl Larson, and I'm also studying the Northern Pacific rattlesnake, uh, but down in... Hello? Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll just redo that. Um, so my name's... Uh, I think it's cutting in and out. Do you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm a master's student. I'm currently working under Carl Larson, and I'm also studying uh, the Northern Pacific rattlesnake, but down in a soy use. And uh, it's my pleasure to host Mike today for the seminar. Um, I actually got to know him a little bit over email, have never met him, but in 2017, I was frantically asking him a bunch of questions about my research, and he kindly gave me his advice. Um, but Mike uh, has a wide array of knowledge and has uh, done a ton of important publications over the years with a variety of topics, including venom studies, ecology, um, vast array, but he's also uh, helped c edit a book called The Biology of the Rattlesnakes, which is over 600 pages and 90 authors. Um, and on top of all of this work, he ha also helped with Jared Maida's uh, defense in, de in December. He was an external. So uh, Mike does a lot here, and we really appreciate the work he's done over the years. And today he's going to talk to us about the snakes we have here in Kamloops, but all the way down in California. So uh, I'm going to pass it off to Mike. So join me in welcoming him. Do you guys want me to use the handheld? Oh, you don't need that. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Dana. And uh, thanks to Carl for the invitation to do this. We've been, he's kind of been talking about it for, uh, for several years, and we, and we finally did it. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure to talk about um, the same species of rattlesnake that you have here, but in a different place, in a different climate, certainly. Um, but before I do that, um, I want it, to, it dawned on me, given the, the diverse audience potentially, that I should probably talk about um, why we study rattlesnakes. I mean, what in the world would motivate us, or what value is there in studying rattlesnakes? And actually, there's a lot of things to be gained from it. The primary things, I mean, kind of what motivates me is, as I've been telling folks earlier, I've always been fascinated in animals that I thought most people unreasonably fear. And that doesn't mean that rattlesnakes aren't dangerous, but, you know, in the States, they only kill five or six people a year. And, of course, I'm sure it's far less in Canada because there's very few places where you have rattlesnakes in Canada. And more people are killed by dogs and horses, but yet... Rattlesnakes have this kind of urban legend status, and everybody either loves them or hates them. And of course, it's not 50 50. Um, but, you know, we know so little about them, and what most people think they know about them is often not true. So, having, you know, some, some actual knowledge that's well documented um, that allows us to put out correct information, number one, really satisfies me, but also ER docs. Uh, are very interested in snake venom and the effects of snake venom. And the more we study snake venom, the more complex and variable we learn that it is. And that's all an ongoing thing. But the other uh, interesting aspect of snake venom is that there's a lot of interest amongst pharmaceutical companies in identifying components of snake venom, identifying what those components do when they are injected into some other organism with the idea that they can model new therapeutic drugs after snake venom components. And it's not just snake venoms, but other kinds of venomous animals as well. But just in snake venoms, we know that in many venoms, 
um, biologists, or um, biochemists rather, can identify up to 100 proteins and, and peptides um, all in one venom. And we don't know what many of those molecules do. And to help the biochemists and the pharmacologists figure out what those components do, they need to know how the snake uses the venom. How do they hunt? What do they hunt? How do they kill it? How does the, what causes the prey animal to die? Um, and that's where field biologists come in. So what I'm going to talk about today is a field study that I did on northern Pacific rattlesnakes, same species you have here, but in a very, very different climate. And I want to um, kind of give a quick shout out to the organizations and some people that I couldn't have done my, my um, field study without uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, are we going to turn the lights down just a little bit? Someone mentioned. Um, thanks very much. So um, that's perfect. I mean, just the screen's, screen's great. Thank you. So as I said, it's the same species of rattlesnake that you have here. But you know, here, up in Kamloops, you are right at the northern limit of the Cordylus origanus, or the northern Pacific rattlesnakes range. And what I'm going to talk about is a study site that's 1,400 kilometers south. So as you can imagine, that's a very different climate. Here in British Columbia, obviously, you just have to go outside. Like I, the shock that I got yesterday when I got off the plane over at the airport. Um, you know, we used to call reptiles cold-blooded, which is kind of a misnomer because in the right conditions, they can maintain a body temperature every bit as warm or a little bit warmer than, than our body temperature. The difference is that they rely on their environment rather than metabolic heat for, for body heat. So in an environment like this, there are not very many places where rattlesnakes can go, or other reptiles to go, where they can get deep enough to be sure to avoid freezing. And that refuge has to be reliable enough that by the time they go back to it in the fall, it's, they're sure it's still there. Because if it's not there, of course, they're likely to not pass any more genes on after that mistake. Um, further south, snakes overwinter in rodent burrows and all sorts of other um, soft soil structures that sometimes collapse or are abandoned by the rodent and then they're no longer there a few months later. But where it's not terribly cold, the snake has the opportunity to, uh, to hibernate somewhere else. So what we're talking about up here, of course, for those of you that are not familiar with some of the work that Carl's students have been doing, you know, rattlesnakes have to migrate in the fall to a few scarce hibernacular, we call them, shelters where they can get deep enough reliably to survive the winter. And then in the spring, the snakes that go to those uh, scarce shelters can't hang around the shelter because often there is not much of a food base there, and if there is, there's certainly not enough rodents and, and other um, food to support all the snakes in this communal shelter. So they have to migrate out, sometimes pretty good distances, to get to their summer foraging areas. So what we're going to talk about is the contrast between this cold weather habitat here and where I did my four-year study down in, in Southern California, or in Middle California, actually. And the whole idea of a Mediterranean climate um, I thought about, as I was on my way up here yesterday, you know, as, as our planet warms, which it certainly is, um, you know, this may become a kind of antiquated term. But historically, it's been considered to be um, places where there's a uh, mild, wet winter and a hot, dry summer. And, you know, it tends to occur, at least historically in, in our history, in temperate latitudes and uh, just in a very few places around the world. Um, and northern, you know, where my study site is, uh, falls right in that area. Um, my study site's just east of Sacramento in California's Great Valley. Uh, and it's at an elevation of only about 20 meters. So it's, it's 12 degrees in latitude south of here. And it's over 300 meters in elevation lower than um, at least Kamloops, or TRU, whether uh, some of the study sites that Carl's students are working on are, are different elevations, certainly. But this is almost at, at sea level. So the study site is at a nature center uh, along the American River. It's, 
bounded, as you can see, on the, on the east by the American River, on the south by a park that has a golf course involved in it. And then there's a, a uh, densely populated residential area along this, above this bluff on the north uh, east side. And it's a 40 hectare area that uh, the buildings are, are right here. The parking lot's here, the visitor center, and, and a couple other buildings are here. But the rest of that is this riparian oak woodland um, nature preserve. And it's really a pretty cool place. There's, there's three common species of oaks. There's cottonwoods and American walnuts and, and some other trees in less abundance. But it's full of wildlife, all sorts of wildlife. And there are maintained trails that are heavily uh, used, especially on weekends in nice weather. Lots of folks from the nearby city come and often bring their kids to see, to see wildlife. But the big difference from, from here that I'm talking about is this. I mean, you look outside here now, and then you look at this slide, and this is what that study site looks like now in the middle of the winter. Remember, Mediterranean climates are mild, wet winters. And if you look at the precipitation records for this spot, you can see it rains in the winter and it's dry in the summer, the, the very half of the very definition of a Mediterranean climate. If you look at the temperatures, if you look at the lows there, even in December and January, the average low is four degrees. And that doesn't mean it doesn't ever freeze, but when it does freeze, it's just a few degrees below freezing and it doesn't last very long. Usually by the, the sun comes up, it's right back above freezing again. So big difference in climate, which has an enormous difference on the behavior of the snakes, even though they're the same species. One of the biggest differences is that these snakes don't have to find deep, reliable, and scarce hibernacula or, or winter shelters to spend the winter. In fact, rather than deep crevices, these guys hibernate pretty much um, always, in my four years experience, either in or under these old oak tree logs that are laying all over that 40 hectares. I um, mean, there's just dozens and dozens of these logs. Um, and these snakes will just go inside the hollow logs or into cavities underneath the logs that have probably been excavated by rodents and, and spend the winter there. And they'll occasionally be out basking on a warm day when the sun's out. They won't leave the log, but they'll sometimes be laying in the sun right under the, uh, the edge of the log. And there's lots of rattlesnakes there. We know or, or we estimate from the number of snakes that we've marked which is almost 60 in four years, um, adults, not counting uh, youngsters, that there are about 100 adult rattlesnakes in that 40 hectares. And most people that live there and have worked there and hiked in there a lot are just astounded because they will tell you, most of them, that I've never seen a rattlesnake or I saw one three years ago. But in 40 hectares, we think there's about 100 adult rattlesnakes because we, we captured and marked uh, over 50 and the last year that we did field work there, 2017, about half of our chance encounters, and by chance encounters, I mean excluding the radio telemetry ones, about half of them were marked and about half were not marked. So if we've got roughly 50 some marked, we think there's about 100 adult rattlesnakes in the park. If we look at their seasonal movement, there's several things to, to notice here. Number one, they're active in March. Your snakes aren't active in March here. Your snakes aren't active until, what, about June or so? Uh, and they're, they continue to be active into November. Um, and the, the movement that you see there on the, on the vertical axis, this is the average daily movement going up to 100 meters. And of course, the, the blue line is the males, the red line is the females. And those peaks that you see are not migrations to and from winter dens that are some distance away from their summer foraging area. The peaks in the movement that you see are essentially stimulated by reproductive urges. Um, these snakes have a bimodal re uh, courtship season where they, they start courting in the late summer, fall. They're interrupted by winter and they're dormant for about three months and then they pick up again in the spring and in fact the spring half of the uh, season is usually 
a little more vigorous than the fall. And then by, you know, mid or late May, it starts to calm down, and then you have this quiet period during the hot part of the summer. But that's all uh, motivated by, all that movement is motivated by uh, reproduction. Um, the males have uh, much greater movement during those times than the females because, like a lot of other animals, you tend to find the females where there's resources. You know, the females find a place where, where there's food and where there's shelter, and for the females, Shelter means also having a good place to thermoregulate when they're pregnant. Usually, uh, these guys will use a log. Another study site that we had uh, further up in the foothills, they used rocks. But they'll find an object that they can hide under that is just the right mass to stay warm at night so they don't cool off at night during the summer and is big enough and massive enough that it absorbs the sun's heat without them getting too hot underneath. So if you look at the body temperatures of these snakes, which we can calculate, by the way, from the pulse interval of the radios for the ones that are telemetered, pregnant females that are thermoregulating usually in a 24-hour period only vary a few degrees Celsius um, in body temperature when the outside temperature is going up and down by, by uh, a lot as the sun goes up and down. They stay in these places where they stay warm at night and reasonably cool during the day. And that starts about in June uh, middle of June, late June, pregnant females are in their, their rookeries or their gestation uh, shelters. And then the, the snakes give birth to live young towards the end of August or the first part of September. But more about uh, reproduction here in a minute. But again, contrasting with this latitude up here in British Columbia, you know, the snakes down there, 1,400 kilometers south, have an activity period that's eight months or more long. And they don't spend any of that time migrating to or from their, their summer foraging area. When they come out of hibernation, the females are looking for food and the males are looking for females. And it happens immediately. And at the same time that they come out of hibernation, their, their food species come out of hibernation. And you know, there's, there's plenty of rodents. Um, I'm showing you California ground squirrels here, and they, pe they feed heavily on the pups. And there's a lot of research going on uh, about the resistance that the adult squirrels have developed to this northern Pacific rattlesnake venom and this arms race that uh, we're pretty sure goes on between the snakes developing venom to kill the squirrels and the squirrels developing resistance to the venom. Because um, these adult squirrels can uh, survive the bite, a full-on bite by an adult rattlesnake most of the time. They'll get a, a lesion that's maybe two and a half or three centimeters in diameter that'll scab and, and heal. And uh, they survive most of those bites. The pups, on the other hand, have the same uh, compounds in their blood, but they don't have enough body mass to absorb a good bite. So uh, a, a good bite will overwhelm their body, uh, the, whatever resistance they have, kills the pup, and the snakes feed on the pups a lot. But they'll also eat voles and mice and uh, all sorts of lizards. And I'm sure, I never found uh, evidence of birds, but we're sure that um, they'll eat birds if they find birds. Um, but there's plenty of food. And that also starts as soon as everybody comes out of hibernation at about the same time. So there's plenty of food around. The snakes don't have to worry about migrating. They start feeding and courting right away. Just two of my... This is what, you know, I, I try and get photographs of the snake's prey, and try as I could, that's the best vole photograph I, I got. <laughs> and that was the tail end of the vole, obviously. But, and they, you know, they eat, they eat lizards when they're babies, and they, they transition largely to small mammals as they get larger, but even the adults will, will eat lizards when they can catch them. So, a little bit about how we study rattlesnakes, and, and Carl and his students are, are very familiar with this, but you know, since the advent of transmitters, actually the, the real um, advance, I think, came with batteries that were small enough and lasted long enough that you could pair them with a little radio transmitter and surgically implant them in a snake to, to last long enough to be, to be worthwhile. Because um, you can't put a collar around a snake, you can't attach the, uh, well, I suppose you could attach the transmitter externally, but the snakes crawl through uh, openings and such, they'll, they'll uh, either get hung up or they brush the, something externally off. 
So I'm going to show you a little video of the surgery that we used to put the transmitter in. Um, the transmitter weighs 9 grams, and it's about the size of the last two joints in your finger. It's implanted in the abdomen about three-quarters of the way back from the rostrum. It's, it's anchored in place with a, a non-absorbable suture, kind of a loose loop. It doesn't bind the transmitter to the ribs, but it, it's loose enough that the, the transmitter can't migrate around in the abdomen. Then we feed this little sterile brass tube up under the skin on the left side of the snake. And the antenna is about 24 centimeters long, and we feed that little Teflon-coated antenna into that tube, close the skin, and then you go up along the side of the snake and find the end of that tube under the skin. You make just a little snip under a scale in the skin and pull the tube out. And what's left is this abdominal implant with the um, transmitter, and then this 24 centimeter antenna that runs up the left side of the snake under the skin. And that transmitter, the 9 gram transmitters last about a year. You have to replace them annually. But it allows us to find the snake, and because they're temperature sensing, we can calculate from the pulse interval of the transmitter what the snake's body temperature is, which is pretty useful. While the snake is anesthetized, I also inject a unique uh, combination of colored acrylic paint in the, uh, the last um, hollow segment of the rattle. And that allows us to visually identify the snakes, especially if we find more than one. If we've got a telemetered snake, we've got a, a radio signal, and there's more than one snake there. If we can see the rattle, we can tell who's who. And of course, if there's a rattle without paint in it, we know it's a snake that we've never captured. And then we use this, um, this camera that is actually, it's built by Rigid Tools, and it's not terribly expensive. It's an inspection camera. And it's got a, a probe on it that's almost a meter long with this, this uh, end, uh, camera and some LED illumination. And you can maneuver that into holes or into logs, um, any kind of a void that you, uh, uh, you want to look into. And you can see what's going on. You can take still pictures or, um, or video. <coughs> Excuse me. So with the transmitters, um, of course, we can find the snakes, and we would usually try and, and relocate them two or three times a week. And over time, by logging where we locate them, you know, we can figure out what they're doing at various times during the season. And, and over a full season, we can put together their home ranges. You know, what, what area do they, do they use throughout the year? Um, and, and that's an idea of what area they might you know, that kind of species might uh, need in another area in terms of um, conservation issues and that sort of thing. But uh, I'll point out here, too, that the study started with the snakes that um, were either found by staff members or reported by visitors around the buildings or the parking lot. So this was the first four rattlesnakes that got radios. And as a result, you know, these, this whole cohort of, of snakes tended to be mostly active in, in this general area here. And remember that, that preserve is much, much larger than that. Um, and over that first year and a half, we started identifying where the snakes hung out a lot. And, of course, we gave them names, these various places. And the, the first place that attracted our attention was this hollow stump that had all kinds of, the roots went down in the ground, and I think it had been excavated by ground squirrels, and the snakes loved that place. And now, these are not winter shelters. I'm talking about congregation of snakes during the warm season. Um, I call this the community center because snakes, all of the snakes that we had radios in, and many snakes that we didn't, came and went from there all the time. Um, both males and non-reproductive females would show up there when they're shedding. Those of you that, that aren't familiar with, with snakes, um, you may know that they slough the outer layer of their skin periodically as they grow. Uh, youngsters shed more frequently than, than large snakes that aren't growing much. But for about a 10-day period or so, uh, they, they're forming the new skin. They'd use this place for that. Females would gestate there, usually Three or four females a year would sit in there and thermoregulate while they're pregnant. They'd have their kids in there. Um, the males would show up looking for the females and court females there. 
The only thing that didn't happen at the community center was overwintering. As far as I know, snakes never spent the winter under that stump, which I thought was a little odd. But there's other odd things. Um, this log quickly attracted our attention too, and this was one where they did, a lot of snakes did spend the winter, but they also used it during the, during the warm season for the same thing. Snakes would come there to hang out until they shed. Females thermoregulated there when they were pregnant. They had babies there. Um, they did all the same things, including spending the winter there. And it wasn't just individual snakes. There were, we think, probably four, five, or six rattlesnakes under there most, uh, most winters. And then other places, the hillside log was um, right across on the hillside, just in front of the door to the nature center's um, visitor center. And same thing as the community center, although not nearly as heavily used. Um, females thermoregulated there when they were pregnant, had babies there, snakes would come there to shed. Um, but nobody, as far as I know, hibernated there during the winter. Um, the love boat's kind of interesting. Um, it gets its name from, of course, the, the TV series from long ago. But this was a pretty small, um, unimpressive log, certainly from my point of view, and maybe from the snake's point of view. But it had this unique distinction that every spring, all four years, uh, female, as soon as they'd come out of hibernation, females, one at a time usually, very little overlap, would go to this little log, and then males would just cruise through. And usually one at a time, if there were two males there, they usually weren't, um, one would be with the female, the other would be someplace nearby. Um, and after a week or so, that female would leave, and another female would show up, and the males would cruise through again. And often, some of the same males would come back when there's another female there. And by, you know, by the end of May, when that springtime courtship season dies off, there wouldn't be any snakes there. And the snakes wouldn't show up later in the year. Nobody hibernated there. Nobody had babies there. It was just about two months in the springtime when females would hang out and males would come and visit, hence the name. The pretty unusual. And, and remember now, there are dozens and dozens of very similar looking logs all over this 40, well, not the whole 40 hectares, because as you, well, you can see here, a lot of this is um, floodplain along the river. But from, from this place, you know, over all the woodland here, is full of these logs. And the vast majority of them, um, the snakes never congregated at. You'd find a snake under one every now and then, but you didn't stay there. There weren't other snakes there. Um, so why they picked these particular logs is really interesting. This live oak tree is, is uh, only in there because our number 41 female hibernated under the, in the roots of that tree every year by herself, as far as I know. Um, she reproduced three out of the four years that we were working there. She always had her babies under the hillside log, and then she would spend the winter under that oak tree. Again, I think by herself. And then the meadow log uh, was always there, and until we got several transmitters and snakes and, and had some time under our belt, we didn't realize how significant it was. But before we were done, we, we learned that there was a good deal of activity there. Snakes hibernated there um, and uh, gestated and, and went there to shed the whole, whole nine yards. And again, think about the scale here. If, when we're talking about snakes in cold climates like this, that that have to migrate between scarce winter shelters and their summer foraging areas, you're often talking kilometers. And here, most of these places are separated by dozens of meters. Um, very, very short distances compared to colder climates. And then in October 2015, this lady, um, Erica Mitchell, brought this photograph in. And this is two male rattlesnakes fighting a male rattlesnakes fight over a female rattlesnake. So there's no doubt there's a female there somewhere. But the interesting thing was, it was late enough in the year that I knew that our telemetered snakes were already at the shelters where they were going to spend the winter. So I figured that there's at least three snakes here. It's right next to a log. That log must be another winter shelter that I'd never seen. And she had described to me about where she had, had taken the picture. And I knew she took it from a, a trail. So I took this photograph. And I, I searched the trails for a, a while. I eventually found Erica's log. And of course, it was late in the year. It was too late to see snakes that year. 
But I watched it the following spring, and it was loaded with rattlesnakes. Um, as soon as it got warm and the sun came out, if you went down on the south side of the log, which luckily was opposite from where the trail was, um, there were probably a dozen rattlesnakes in various piles where there was openings under the log. Um, so this was kind of a big discovery for us. Um, we telemetered some, we, we caught as many as we could, which is not all, by the way, because they're, they're very quick. They don't want to hang around and, and confront something the size of a person. So, you know, they're quick to disappear um, when you approach. But, you know, we caught a fair number of them. We put radios in, I think, three, marked a bunch of others. And over the next uh, couple of years, we, we found a couple of places that were really interesting that these snakes went. Interestingly, except for a wandering males actually gave birth in shelters out in that floodplain. And I'll show you a video from, um, from this thing here in a minute. But uh, we also found two of the males hibernated by themselves each of the last two summers. I call this the bachelor pad because there were no other snakes there that I know of. The only two snakes were, were males that we had originally, I don't think they spent the winter at Erica's log. I think when we found them, because this isn't very far apart, I think they had, considering that they spent the next three winters that I know of under this log and it wasn't far away, my guess is they'd already emerged and were over there looking for um, females. And then in September of that year, I was out with uh, uh, some actually journalism graduate students from UC Santa Cruz up near the bluff, uh, right at the northern end of where our original cohort of rattlesnakes usually wandered. And I found this little baby rattlesnake that you see on the right there. And as I, I looked around, I found this adult sticking her nose out from underneath the log and tongue flick. Long story short, I assumed it was right at birth time. I assumed that that was a birthing rookery and that was the female. And a few days later, I caught a postpartum female there that may or may not have been this adult, put a transmitter in her, and um, that was what I called the UCSC log for the guys that were with me when I found it. But she led us to this bluff log. And the bluff log was a lot like Erica's log in that the following spring, there were a dozen or so rattlesnakes that were basking and, and appeared uh, around that log. The following spring, though, was 2017. That was the last year of our field study. We knew it was going to be the last year. So I didn't put transmitters in new snakes at that point because they were only going to give me part of a, a season's data, which I didn't think was going to be all that, that uh, useful in the end for analysis. But there was plenty of snakes there. Um, and we went back, and, and so we start analyzing data, and it's not all entered and, and uh, worked out yet. But there's some things I can, I can point out to you. And number one is home range size. And there's only six home ranges shown here, uh, three males and three females, just because it, it gets a lot more busy the more you layer on there. But the, the message is that the males have a home range that's about three times the size of the females, on average. And it varies a lot. Um, some of them have larger home ranges and some smaller. But just in general, males have about a three time larger home range. And that, again, just like the daily movement, uh, we think is because the males wander all over the place looking for females, where the females have their favorite places where they have all the resources they need, and they don't move around a whole lot. Um, if we put this kind of in context, if we overlay it with the, uh, the satellite photo, and I know you can't see the satellite photo very well, but again, here's the buildings, here's the parking lot. Um, and these are all part of that first cohort that were captured or around the buildings or those snakes led us to, which were in this very area. But what's interesting about this, these home ranges are calculated with, with what's called the minimum convex polygon method, um, where we just take all the spots where we found the snake during the year and you just draw a polygon around them, as long as you don't have any convex sides. And the three logs that I have labeled here are not winter refugia. These are, are places where the snakes congregated during the warm weather and they didn't spend the summer. I mean, sorry, didn't spend the winter. And if you look at some of these home ranges, you know, these are either at the apex of a lot of the polygons or they're right on the, the flat margin of the polygons. So these snakes are going out of their way to go to these particular logs, and I 
you know, there's no environmental reason that I can see for them to do that. The, the weather is certainly mild. They don't have, they don't, they're not forced to go to uh, certain shelters to get out of the freezing temperatures because it doesn't freeze. Um, and besides, this is during the, these shelters are used during the summer. Um, you know, these snakes are congregating for some reason besides an environmental reason, as near as I can tell. Um, more about that at the end. Let me show you some reproduction. I'm going to show you a couple of photo, or a couple of videos, hopefully. Um, one, let me, and I can, I can play this a second time, uh, which I, I probably will because it's kind of brief. But when snakes are courting, the female is usually pretty passive. And the male finds the female. And during the courtship season, of course, he's pumped up full of testosterone. And he'll get his chin on top and often more of his body on top of the female and he gets this jerky motion and he chin rubs the top of her and tongue flicks and rubs his chin on her and then he'll start trying to wiggle his tail under her tail and get their, their cloacas uh, next to each other where if she is receptive he might be able to mate with her. So what you're going to see is some of that behavior and I have two videos here I can show you. Now the male, the female, her head is here, here's the male's head up here. And you can see that jerky motion. You can see some tail searching here. But he's not even close. <laughs> this is early in the process. But what was, and I'll tell you um, a quick story about these two in particular. This is the 41 female. Um, and this was, I, I think, 2016. And for almost two weeks after she came out of hibernation. And these snakes, you have to understand, are ambush predators. They'll coil up where they think they can catch something to kill, and then they'll sit there quietly until a vole or a ground squirrel pup or a lizard or something comes along. So it's hard to imagine that she's going to be able to ambush anything with this male on top of her moving. And for almost two weeks, she moved around and moved a considerable distance, and he followed her. And he just continually was courting, courting her and courting her. And, you know, she's trying to eat, and so she can, you know, put body fat back on so she can, can reproduce again. And I don't know if he was ever successful, but I doubt that she was, was able to get anything to eat during that whole two weeks. And finally, he disappeared. Whether she gave in or not, I have no idea. Um, so I think he saw that. This other video, um, you see the jerky movement. Um, you can hardly see the female here. That doesn't work. Female's right here underneath the male. Here's some tail searching going on. They're much closer to, to being in the right place. And I set up a little GoPro camera on a tripod, went off and left it. An hour later, they were copulating. And all you see, the only movement you see here is just a little bit of movement by the male. Um, but what the male will do usually is wrap his tail under the female. And if she's receptive, uh, they'll mate for, uh, in this species, not very long. Um, just a few, a few hours, I think, is, is pretty much the most. Some of the species you hear about uh, them copulating for a day or more. Uh, these guys usually, they'll, they'll be uh, copulating for a few hours. You come back the next day, and they can be 100 meters apart. Uh, this is just another still photo of um, copulation. The male here, he had his tail wrapped underneath hers. This is the female. The male's marked. You see the female is a new snake. No paint in the rattle. Um, since we've been able to do um, good radio telemetry, we know that Females hang around with their pups uh, after they're born. This is uh, that hillside log that I was talking about. This is one of our telemetered females, and here's two of our kids right here. And they'll hang together for about 10 days or two weeks until the kids shed. And as soon as they shed, everybody goes their separate ways. Mom probably hasn't eaten since June, um, so she's pretty hungry, and she goes right off uh, to feed as the kids do. This is a, a, a litter that's a little older. They're, they're probably a week or so older, and as I mentioned, when they're getting ready to shed, their eyes get blue. Um, the baby rattlesnakes shed for the first time about 10 days after they're born. Mom stays with them, um, again, until they shed. I'm going to show you another video, um, and this is the one out in the, the floodplain that our number 53 female led us to, and she's one of the females we telemetered from Erica's log, and she went in this really nondescript hole in the in the river bottom that didn't look like it was excavate, excavated by a rodent. But when she got in there, there was another pregnant female in there too. 
So the video I'm going to show you is after 53 has had her babies, the babies have already shed, and she and her kids are gone. But the other female that we didn't have a radio in, she's not even marked, has had her babies. And I'm pushing that, that uh, rigid camera down the hole. Um, and you'll see a couple of babies here in a minute. But what you're seeing here are the shed skins, like this one. That's one of the, the shed skins from one of 53's babies that's already gone. This gal has still got her babies in there. They haven't, see two of them crawl by here in a second. And you'll note how attentive she is when the babies go by. Now this yellow skin you see her laying on, we can't see it right now, right here, that's some old adult shed skin that's been there a while, that's why it's yellow. See so you're checking out her kids there. We had no idea that, that these female rattlesnakes um, cared about their kids. We, until we started radio tracking, we, everybody I think believed that you know, they give birth to these live kids and as soon as they give birth, everybody goes their separate ways. Um, but that's not the case. So again, this is old shed skid. This is new neonate shed from 53's kids. And the, the pups that you see there haven't shed yet. And then, you know, we have blood from all of the snakes that we processed. Um, I think there's 58 of them. And then after these uh, uh, kids would shed, we get in there with a, a very scientific instrument that we made out of a coat hanger with a pair of pliers and made a hook on the end of it. And, and we fish out as many of those little uh, shed skins from the babies as we could, because between the blood and we get DNA out of the, the shed um, exuvia, shed skins, we're going to do um, some genetic work and work out um, relationships between all of these 60-some these snakes, 60-some adults, not counting the babies. So I just want to end with where I think we're going and why I, I have a strong hunch that we saw what we saw. We kind of have three cohorts of rattlesnakes. And they're certainly separated by time because we didn't, we didn't find Erica's log until we were uh, towards the end of our second study. And then we actually found these guys up here the last year, the fourth year, and didn't get to collect much data up there. But what's clear is that these snakes have home ranges that overlap a lot. Uh, that is snakes from different groups, these three groups. And we uh, would occasionally find males from one group in one of these summertime groups, um, at especially the community center, we would have snakes from, after we knew about them, and we had them marked, we would have snakes from here in the community center. And by the way, once we found this log, we found snakes that we had marked over here, only males, down here hibernating. Actually, it's this one. Um, and then, you know, it was one of our males that led us up here the day that we came across that baby and that led us to the, the, uh, the log at the bottom of the bluff. I think what we're going to find when we do the, the genetics is that we've got three groups of snakes that are hanging out in family groups. I think they're socializing with their, their kin. And, you know, the males are, are, are moving around and, you know, the groups are interbreeding because of visiting males. But uh, I think we're going to find they're hanging out in social family groups. And that's only been shown in one other species, and it's the timber rattlesnake, Crotalus hortus, in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and it was shown genetically that they were, they were hanging out in, in family social groups. And there's, you know, I've spent a lot of time, uh, I've spent many years when people would tell me stories about, you know, crazy things they thought rattlesnakes did that required a fair amount of conniving on the snake's part. I remind him, you know, a rattlesnake's brain's the size of a sunflower seed. And I never gave them, I think, uh, the credit for doing some of the things that we now know they do. Um, we, Rulon Clark down at San Diego State, has some great video of an ambushing northern Pacific rattlesnake um, using his head and neck pushing dry grass out of the way to make, make a path where he can strike when there's a ground squirrel burrow out here in front. Um, you know, it, it looks like, and we now know the females hang out with their kids. Um, I think we're going to find that these guys, we know that Crotalus hortus, the, the timber rattlesnakes, I think we're going to find these things are hanging out and socializing in family groups. 
Um, so I think there's a lot more going on with these animals than we ever gave them credit for. So with that, um, I'd be happy to, to hang around and take questions. All right, thank you, Mike. Sure, my um, pleasure. If any of you have a question now, I'll just ask that you wait to grab the mic to answer it so that people streaming can hear your question. So whoever has a question, we'll take them now. Got one right here. Hi. Yes, sir. Uh, my question is about um, uh, critical mass in population uh, in that 40 hectare area. So once they've had all these kids, where do they go to? I mean, other than some of them hanging around and continuing. Yeah, where do the kids go to and yeah. what's the critical mass? Right. That is an interesting question. and. and kind of two parts to the answer. One, we'd love to be able to radio track the babies. But, and, and the people that make the transmitters make transmitters for bats and all kinds of small animals. But because we have to surgically implant radios in snakes, the batteries for those little bitty transmitters only last a few weeks. And they don't last long enough, you know, we'd be constantly um, operating on the snake. So we just don't have a good way yet to follow the babies. But what we find is, in September and October, after they've given birth, the babies are pretty common. I mean, you see them around a good bit. By the following spring, they're hard to find. And I think it's predation. I think, I think the vast, of course, remember, just again, just like other kinds of animals, if the adults are producing, doing anything more than replacing themselves, the population is going to explode, and vice versa. And I think very few of those those kids survive very long. I mean, when they're small, um, somebody a couple of years ago sent me a photograph of a blue jay with a baby rattlesnake in its mouth. Um, you know, when they're adults, they've got a lot, many fewer predators. I mean, rap, big raptors and coyotes and bobcats and things. Um, they're there, and of course, other places, badgers and, and uh, there's other, other uh, predators. But when they're babies, a lot of things eat them, herons, uh, even away from the water a little bit, crows, ravens. Um, so I think, I used, to, I used to think, well, maybe if they don't feed before hibernation, they might starve to death during hibernation. And um, I took several newborns that I knew hadn't fed, um, put them in buckets in my garage, and let them spend the winter in my garage, and cooled off, and they did just fine, hardly lost any weight. So I don't think they've starved to death. I don't, if they don't feed before they, they go down, I think they're okay during the winter. I think the reason you'll find them in the spring is so many predators eat them when they're little. And of course, as they grow, the bigger they get, the fewer predators they have. Did that answer your question? As yeah. best I can. The only thing that would follow is that an increase in noted or noticeable predators in the area after the birth. Uh, is there an increase in predators after the births? Um, not that I've noticed, but there's pr plenty of predators there all the time. I mean, there's a lot of wildlife there, so um, I don't know. I got the mic, Mike. Hi. I got the mic, Mike. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm glad we're going for dinner because I got a million things to ask you. But <laughs> the, the first thing that just plowed me over was how none of your snakes venture into the development area. Like it looked like there was a fence there. So is the, there a the fence? The residential area? Yeah, or any, any of the areas there. No, so, there's, there's no fences that snakes will use. So but, what, um, what's going on then? Is it, have, has this relationship been there long enough that we've just seen those snakes know not to go into the... No. Because this is a big problem up here. Well, and this is uh, a really steep bluff. I mean, it's so steep that I had trouble climbing it, and it's loose, but of course the snakes don't have a problem going up it. But you'll notice, I mean, the bluff is right in here. So these two males were up, you know, they would get up in the residential area, and... Um, the three snakes that I lost, well, two were killed by predators, but three others. Um, and I would go up there, and if a snake got in the residential area, which didn't happen very often, maybe a couple times a season, I would go up and try and get a hold of the, the landowner. And, and there's a lot of expensive homes up here and a lot of long driveways and gates and no trespassing signs. And usually, by the time I could get a hold of a, or before I could get a hold of the landowner, the snake would be back down the hill in the the riparian area. Um, a couple times, snakes disappeared. 
And um, one of them, um, the transmitter just laid up there in the sun. I knew, I knew the snake was dead because when the sun would come out, the temperature would go way up into the lethal range. And um, another one just disappeared. And I, I know what, what yard he was in. I talked to the guy, and the guy said, yeah, I saw a snake here, but you know, I just shoot him off. When the transmitter went dead. Snake would never came back. So to answer your question, there's no fence. There is a really steep hillside. Um, the snakes do go up it, especially, I think, the snakes that, uh, you don't show it on here, but that um, bluff log had a lot of snakes. They live on the hillside. They overwinter there. Um, but you know, I had several snakes that got into those yards and, and came back down after a couple of days, and people, I assume, never knew it, or they'd have been killing the snake. or They all knew about the study because we contacted them, and, and they could have called. Uh, one lady did call a couple of times. I'd go up and, and uh, remove the snake and put it back down in the, in the uh, riparian area. But I don't think they got into there very often. Um, they never ventured into the golf course that I know of. This was our, our 39 female. It was kind of interesting. Out of four years, she reproduced three times. And she would always have her kids in the stump that I called the community center. And as soon as the kids would shed, I'd go out there and I'd find her and her kids gone. And the, all three times, all three years that she gave birth, I would find her a couple hundred meters over here in a, on the other side of the road in a blackberry bush. And she would not just be in the same bush. She'd be in the same about square meter of that bush. And one, one year I went over there and found her. And she's laying in the sun with a big lump in her where she'd eaten a squirrel. Um, but she goes right over there and, and hunts for about a month or five weeks or so. And when it starts to cool off, she comes back over to the meadow log. And that's where she spent the winter, all four winters. And three years that she reproduced, she did that exact same series of movements. Um, but I never found them out in here. I had a snake hang out up here uh, right by the gate into the park for a while. But as far as I know, he was right behind the, the yards here, never went into the yards. Um, they didn't venture into the yards very much. And when they did, you know, some of them lost their lives because of it up here. Uh, before I get to my question, Mike, I just want to make sure I'm understanding correctly. Were you saying that the males of one family or social group would sometimes overwinter at sites occupied by a different family or social group? No, no. Oh, they, okay. We only found them in the other, with the other snakes during the summer. And, okay. And they okay. overwinter in their own. That, that's what made it so interesting was they would come back and overwinter under the log where, um, you know, we, they'd always come back to the same log. Which so if they were only intermingling in the summer, was, isn't that the time where the courtship is at its lowest? Wouldn't they want to be mingling with oh, a different no, no, family? I'm, well, that, that, I'm, I'm using the wrong terminology. During the warm weather, you know, I'm not talking about June and July, but, but during the, the entire warm, the, the activity season. So they'd be over there, yeah, during the courtship season. Anybody else? Okie doke. <laughs> I guess I, I keep finding this fascinating, but um, there's some other things that pop in my mind is um, where are the, are, is there any water attractants in this climate? Because this is a lot hotter and drier than here. And do you, you know, you know we, we would never have that many snakes in that small area because it just couldn't support them. So, and, and these are just the telemetered ones. Right. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm wondering two things. One is, what's the density of prey there? We should try and compare that Very if dense. you haven't trapped or something. I haven't done any trapping, but so it's super dense. I'll come down on my sabbatical. We'll trap. Yeah. But uh, um, how, if you look at this whole spatial pattern where they are, do you get a sense they're oblivious to people or are... You know, like I know with, say, cougars and even jaguars, some of the bigger things that have been really tracked, they know where the people are and they know where the trails are and they, they avoid them. And so here's a system where there's, a, I guess there's a fair amount of people traffic. There is. Do you feel they're disassociating from that or are they just oblivious and they're sitting beside the trails and people don't know? Well, that, absolutely. And you can see, you see, because these trails are really heavily used and you can't see the ones in the trees here so much, but they, they're just as heavily used as the ones out here that you can see. So to, to try and answer that, um, 
you know, if they're, if people are moving around, if they're uh, about to cross a trail, for instance, and somebody's moving around, they're going to not cross, and if they're close enough and there's enough activity, they'll go the other way. Um, and I saw that several times. You know, people would would stop me on the trail, want to know what I was doing, because I had this weird antenna, and, and uh, I'd talk to them. And occasionally, I'd have a telemetered snake that's crawling towards the trail, and I'd say, you know, if you want to see one, we stand real still, and he's about to cross the trail, and sure enough, we stood still enough, off across the trail you go. Um, but then there were, there were multiple times where, <laughs> and, and we, we all were always kind of a little conflicted because we'd see this with the telemetered snakes, and you know what happens with the snakes that we, we don't know about all the time, where we'd have a snake in an ambush coil, like a, a half meter off a trail, and the one I'm thinking about, he had a favorite spot, and he would he'd coil up with his back to the trail. And, and it would be on a busy Saturday or Sunday, and there's a million people with kids going back and forth, like this far from him. And he's coiled up there, faced away from the trail, and they had no idea he was there. And he, I'm sure he knew they were there, but he just ignored them. Oh, these I don't, I don't think, I mean, these, we had some, we had snakes that were in great body condition by females reproducing annually right in the middle of this. And um, the, the shot of the snake with the vole tail sticking out of his mouth, that was a day, um, if you look, in fact, um, let me go back to that last slide because there's a website there that um, has got a, a blog and a, some videos. In fact, it's got the videos that the UC Santa Cruz people um, did that www.eyncrattlesnakes.com. There's a whole bunch of information to those videos there. But the guy, the guy that shot the first video, um, George Nyberg, was with me. And it was, again, it was a, a Saturday or Sunday. And there's, there's people all over the place. And it was right past the trailhead um, where people enter the trail system. And again, there's people with strollers, with kids, going back and forth. And I get a radio signal in the grass right next to the trail. And we're standing there, and of course now people are crowding around, and we're parting the grass, and we get down to it, and here's our number 35 male with this vole half down, and he's like this far from the trail, and there's all you know people and strollers and stuff going back and forth, and he's eating a vole, you know, a meter away, or less than a, a little less than a meter away. Um, so I mean they, you know, you you think about it, I guess, the ones that survive as neonates, they grow up in that environment. And, and there's plenty of prey. I mean, there's a, there's a ton of voles. I mean, the, the dry grass that's under the green grass, um, it's just full of vole tunnels. And a lot of times we find the snakes in the vole tunnels. Um, and there's a ton of ground squirrels. And um, you know, at night out there, you'd see uh, not only the voles, but you'd see pocket mice and, and stuff. And there's, a, there's those um, swift um, spiny lizards and alligator lizards. There are skinks. There's lots of stuff for them to eat. So they, they were doing just great. They were, their body condition didn't suffer a bit. Unless, unless somebody didn't like snakes, caught them on the trail, and then it suffered a lot. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that there's logs everywhere, but only a few logs seem to be favored by snakes. Have you tried to characterize what aspects of uh, I, I have, and yeah. I I can't find no. any significant relate. I mean, size, diameter, how hollow it is, uh, what's you know how much is it shaded, not shaded, what's it, you know aspect to the to the sun, how much how much other growth is around it. I mean, so it's social then. I that's my idea. I mean, yeah. I you know. There's, I just don't know of an environmental reason that they're hanging out in the warm weather. In fact, in the cool weather. I should mention, I did a, a four-year study with Mojave rattlesnakes down in the desert previously, where it really it doesn't get nearly as cold as here, but it freezes at night. It, gets, it freezes a lot of nights in that high desert. And those snakes are, they overwinter in rodent burrows, and they don't socialize at all. The only time you find two snakes together is if they're courting or copulating. And they don't go back to the same 
even go back to the same rodent burrow year after year. They'll go down just whatever rodent burrow is nearby when it gets cool. They stay there until it gets warm in the spring and come back up and keep hunting. Um, and, and they don't, they're not communal, either warm weather or cold weather. Um, I don't know why these snakes hang out together unless there's something genetically going on. I can't, I don't know of an environmental reason. It's gonna be, the genetics is going to be interesting. Anybody else? Thank you. So I don't know if this took away the fear or added more. But uh, my question is, so during, if there's like a fire, a wild fire, how do they survive? Do they migrate and then come back or do they just leave forever? No, I'm sure they don't migrate. Um, and we never had a, we didn't have a fire there while I was there. They hadn't been there, one there for some time. Um, but I know where there have been other fires. And when I was in Southern California, um, Behind, and I was affiliated um, with Loma Linda University for a bit, and Loma Linda's in some, some low foothills that are covered with grass and it burns all the time, and there's red diamond rattlesnakes uh, down there. And you know, you find rattlesnakes burned, dead, and uh, they found after one fire a rattlesnake with its rattle kind of all, I won't say melted, but obviously the snake had either been late getting in the hole or the hole wasn't deep enough and the rattle was, was too close and had been damaged by the heat. But they don't migrate. I don't think they, they can't move quickly long distances. Um, I'm sure in a fire they're going to try and go underground. Um, but you know, you, you find them burned up in fires um, sometimes. So. All right, I think that's all the time we have okay. for questions, but can everyone yes, just Dana. join me in thanking uh, Mike again for his wonderful talk? Thank you very much. Sure.